Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my session today. I hope you can hear me, see me fine, and see my slides. Um, thanks for thanks for taking the time to attend this uh, talk. It's uh, middle of the day in Japan, I think. I'm in Berlin, in Germany, and it's 5 a.m., so I can't promise that my brain will be fully functioning. Um, I'm Marta. I'm a developer advocate at Verberica. And today I want to give you an introduction to stream processing and Apache Flight. So I tried to make this talk accessible so that you can follow it uh, independent of your background or if you ever heard about Flink before or not. Uh, I put a little poll here on the side just so you can tell me if it's your first time hearing about Flink or if you're maybe already use it, using it or maybe you've heard of it before. So if you can click that and let me know, that would be pretty cool. And for those of you that never heard about the company Viverica before, um, you might know it as, or it is a company of the people who created Apache Flink. And this means that every day I get to work with the core maintainers uh, of Flink and be involved in this really active uh, and growing open source community. And what Viverica does besides working on Flink uh, is offer an enter enterprise version of um, Flink called Viverica Platform. And what it does is just, it's it's just uh, it really str just streamlines a lot of the operational side of deploying and maintaining stream processing applications. And since the beginning of last year, the company is part of uh, Alibaba, who is also uh, one of the biggest users, but also one of the biggest contributors to the open source project out there. And so I'll I'll just start with a really quick. Uh, recap that introduces you to stream processing if you're not really familiar with the concept or you have a different uh, different background. So if you have at least been working with uh, data for some time, uh, maybe the scenario will, will be familiar to you. So not that long ago, uh, this is what uh, analytics used to look like. So you had a bunch of uh, transactional databases, maybe you had some static sources of data as well. You would run uh, some ETL process, processes to integrate and combine all this data into something useful uh, for your business. And then you would store all of this away in a data warehouse in a nicely, in nicely structured tables that serve, uh, again, some business process. And maybe you'd already have something like a data lake where you just put uh, the raw source data and that you use instead. But this is basically the picture of how analytics looked, at least for me very recently in my in my previous job. And so your your quest to your quest for data would look something like this. You you would run some really long nightly jobs, and after some hours you would have your results. But in reality, what happens is uh, one or one or more of these nightly jobs would fail because your processes run out of memory or because someone decided to use single single quotes instead of double quotes uh, in their input. And then someone would have to wake up, fix the problem, rerun these jobs. Uh, a lot of times that person was me. And someone then, probably a stakeholder, would complain that their data is late. And after all of this, then, you get your results, but they're late. And in the end, if you look at it, most of the source data that you are using for all these processes is continuously produced. So it doesn't really make sense that someone is waiting for, for yesterday's data or that I am waking up in the middle of the night uh, because most of the logic that uh, you use to run to run these ETL processes doesn't really change. It's not something uh, it's not something that is evolving or changing every day. Uh, and what is evolving and changing all the time is the data that you're processing. So something we can't really escape 
is this concept that nowadays everything is a string. And what used to be your uh, static batch data are now events that are continuously produced and you should also be able to continuously process them. So you have a set of event sources that can be anything these days. So from connected devices and vehicles to web clicks, application logs, uh, financial transactions, you name it. And all of them are continuously producing events that, are, that uh, end up at some point in some uh, in a centralized distributed log, something like Kafka or Pulsar or Kinesis. And over this uh, sequence of events that are produced, you likely want to run a set of transformations or computations to kind of mold this data into something that is useful for you. So you might want to do things like filtering out some garbage or correlating events or just doing aggregations over time. Maybe in the, in the, somewhere in the process, you want to persist some intermediate results to some um, long-term storage like uh, S3 or HDFS. And then in the end, you publish your output to a sync. And the time it takes from data to go from the event sources to your sinks uh, might be more or less critical depending on your use case but you certainly don't want to wait a whole day or sometimes more uh, to get your results. So in the simplest terms uh, that I could find to try to explain this, uh, stream processing is, is really what I, what I just described. So you have an infinite uh, data set that is continuous, continuously flowing, it's called a data stream, and you have your code that is going to perform whatever transformations you want to, to do on this data. And you want to process this uh, data stream event by event. So use your code to apply transformations and then just output these transformed events downstream. And things start getting a bit more interesting when you want to do something that is uh, more than just stateless operations. So something like mapping or filtering uh, are stateless operations. Uh, and this is when you, you enter the, the world of stateful stream processing. And here you have the same simple model as before. Uh, you have your input data, your transformations and your output. Uh, but now you have this concept of memory or the ability to remember events as they flow through your code. And the, the, the real challenge of doing stateful stream processing or of uh, kind of keeping track of what you are processing to influence what you're going to process in the future is exactly this memory or your state. Because you not only have to manage the state uh, distributed across multiple machines, uh, but you also have to make sure that it doesn't just vanish when you have some kind of machine failure. So what is Apache Flink, the whole reason why uh, we're here today? So Flink is an open source framework and a distributed engine that allows you to do exactly what I was explaining before, stateful stream processing. So Flink, Flink can continuously consume data from whatever sources um, you want to plug it into. It applies some stateful computation computations on these uh, data streams. And as it processes, it builds up some context. So it keeps track of the state as it goes. And then it produces some output. It's, this could be anything. So an API call updates to a database, other data streams. Uh, and uh, what, what makes Flink really, really powerful and what differentiates it from other from other stream processors is, is the way it really handles this distributed state. And what then makes it really flexible is that it's able to do this one at a time event processing consistently. And because it is such a wide, um, such a, such a wide paradigm 
and uh, such a such a flexible framework. Uh, this this really gives you a very a very solid foundation to address uh, a wide range of use cases. So the use cases that we see companies using Flink for kind of fall into three different categories. So at, at the core, you have uh, classical stream processing use cases. So here. Uh, our use cases that really build on uh, the the core primitives of of Flink, so events, state, and time, um, where data platform um, data or, or platform engineers are are really exploring um, or are really trying to max out Flink to do complex or heavy computations, a lot of uh, logic customization, and the goal uh, here is to maximize the performance and reliability of the systems that you're building. So some examples of these use cases are, um, there, there's a lot of companies out there using Flink to build their core um, data infrastructure. So one example is Netflix. Uh, they're using Flink as a basis for their internal data platform called Keystone. And they're processing, I think, around 3 billion events per day. Uh, so large-scale data pipelines is a very common use case. Um, then, for example, you have Fujitsu that has uh, also built a, a, a real-time IoT data platform, for example, to process data from uh, for autonomous vehicles. And another example is AWS, who is using Flink for log analysis uh, to to monitor um, to monitor monitor and detect anomalies in their clusters. And then on on the other side, um, kind of the 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 rising use cases um, are are on streaming analytics and machine learning. And here, in contrast to what I was saying before, like this more uh, core infrastructure use cases. Um, in, in this kind of cases, Flink is used a bit more on a high level and in uh, domain specific uh, situations. So that can be easily modeled with something like SQL or Python and uh, simple abstractions like, uh, tab like tables. So here, uh, the focus is not so much on implementation details, but it's more on um, quickly being able to build the logic to meet business requirements. And these are use cases where you might have also mixed uh, batch and streaming workloads. And I didn't mention this before, but uh, Flink is also ab able to do efficient batch processing. It's a streaming first, it's a streaming first framework that can also do efficient batch processing. And so here you might want, you might want to do max, um, mixed uh, batch and streaming workloads, for example, for things like uh, backfilling historical data. And the goal is, again, to maximize developer speed and autonomy. So basically uh, make users more independent in their data needs. And this is made possible by using, like I said before, rapid pro prototyping languages like SQL, Python, that allow you some also some degree of freedom, like uh, writing your own user-defined functions, integrating with uh, useful tools like notebooks or machine learning libraries. And, oops, sorry, I skipped the use cases. <laughs> and uh, some examples here on the streaming analytics and machine learning side, you have, for example, Weibo, which is a social, really big social network in China, uh, is using Flink to build unified pipelines for online and offline model training. Um, Uber is also as al also has an internal data platform um, that that uh, allows users to build end-to-end -end streaming analytics pipelines, so users can just submit. Uh, SQL statements, and then Uber built a platform that just compiled everything down to Flink jobs, but users are able to just write plain SQL without any kind of, of code. And uh, in the last, Criteo also has um, 
has created a platform that uh, makes it really easy to generate features for a machine learning model training. And on the other side of the, the spectrum, there's also event-driven applications. And I'm, I'm not going into a lot of detail um, here because it's a bit of a new field for Flink and it might be confusing if you've never heard about Flink before, but if you are um, interested in stateful serverless uh, and, and all, this, all this universe, uh, then, then I dropped some links in here and then you can check um, th this new API called stateful functions. And with this really wide range of use cases that I showed you before, Flink is powering um, a lot of the largest companies in the world. And it serves a very different or very diverse industry vertical. So anything from entertainment to agrotech. And to give you an idea of the scale Flink can go to, uh, the biggest uh, production use case that we know of is really what Alibaba is doing on the double eleven or singles day. Um, and on this day, uh, their infrastructure, Flink is, um, is backing most of uh, Alibaba's real-time data applications in this day. So like search and recommendations, advertisements, and even like this huge um, GMV dashboard that you see all over media. Uh, Flink is running on the, or Flink is, is crunching all the data to actually produce those numbers. So, um, and so, so, so that you have a specific idea of uh, numbers here, uh, they run Flink on thousands and thousands of machines. And at peak, they are processing 4 billion events per second. And they do all of this with sub-second latency. So including updates to uh, feature vector vectors that go into the recommendation system. So uh, this is really Flink maxed out. Uh, we always say it's uh, Flink at Alibaba scale because it's the biggest, it's the biggest, biggest scale use case that, that we, that we know of. But this doesn't mean that you can only use Flink for huge uh, production setups. Uh, you can also go go small. So in in one of our in one of our conferences recently, there there was a company called UHopper that showed how you can run Flink simply on a cluster of five Raspberry Pis uh, to process and aggregate real world IoT data from connected vehicles. So this is really a big contrast when you see the use case that I just talked about, where you have thousands of machines uh, running running Flink, and here you have Flink running on a on a mini cluster of uh, Raspberry Pi. So it also gives you this flexibility in in use cases, and you can just use your laptop, you know, fire it up open an IDE, and then just run or debug your Flink applications locally. And now I'd like to talk about what really makes all of this possible under the hood. So what makes all these use cases, uh, what allows Flink to, 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 go, to go to the scale that Alibaba takes it, for example. So what, what makes Flink Flink? And it's, it's basically a combination of four different things that relate to how Flink was engineered since the beginning. So it has a set of really flexible APIs. Uh, it's able to do stateful processing. Um, it's really optimized and built from the ground, uh, from the ground up for high performance. And uh, it has a fault tolerance. Uh, mechanism that allows you to that allows you to achieve uh, the highest degree of consistency even when you have uh, machine failures and I would also consider that the community uh, is also something that makes flink what it is because it's a really really active open source community um, yeah from from flink release to flink release we see the number of uh, contributors growing and growing so 
it is it is uh, one of the most I think the most active project in the Apache Software Foundation. So I would say that community is also a really a really fundamental part to to Flink. And so I'm going to try now to give you an overview of how all of this is uh, achieved, hopefully without getting too much uh, into the nitty gritty of it. So starting off with uh, the APIs, uh, Flink has a layered structure with uh, different APIs that trade off how easy it is to use and how expressive uh, you can get with it. So this means that at a higher level, you have APIs like uh, SQL and the Table API and PyFlink. They are closer to a relational way of thinking about data. So these APIs uh, allow you to uh, quickly express uh, problems in a very concise way and, do, uh, and let Flink do uh, all the operational heavy lifting for you so you don't have to worry about state management and all these things. And you can use uh, languages that are familiar to you and they're uh, a bit a bit more yeah a bit more either domain specific or a bit quicker to 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 use or more immediate like SQL and uh, Python. And as you go down the API stack, uh, using, using the API starts getting a bit more complex, but you also get more and more control over the programs that you are implementing uh, and also how they are executed. So and when you reach the core billing blocks of Flink, so if you're really working at this level of uh, process functions, which are like the, the smallest unit in Flink, if you want to call it that, um, and you're dealing with state and time uh, and having fine-grained control over all of this, uh, you, really can, you really can do anything with me. And it's, it's pretty straightforward to look at this API stack and kind of think where the use cases that I mentioned before or the categories of use cases uh, fall into. And the good news is that you're not really you don't really have to choose one api uh, all the apis make, are integrated with each other so you can mix and match all the apis you can for example inv uh, invoke a python um, user defined function in a flink sql query or you can convert uh, a table into a stream and vice versa so you really can there's a lot of interplay here to really um, to really fit whatever use case and whatever level of abstraction need you have. And at the core of all of it, and no matter what API you choose to work with, uh, what everything, what, what it boils down to is again, the very simple model that we started with. So your code will define where to consume uh, the data streams from, which uh, here is your source what transformations to apply to it, and where to sync the results. So in this case, I'm using the data stream API, so one of the lower level APIs, to write a very simple uh, Java program that consumes uh, temperature sensor data from, in this case, Kafka, it could be anything. And so this is how you build a Flink program. So you, you add a Kafka consumer as a source. Then you apply some transformations. First, uh, a map operation that converts the temperature from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Then you key uh, your events by sensor ID. And then you collect all these events in a time window of uh, five seconds. Uh, and then you calculate the average temperature and send all of this into an elastic search sync. So what we are basically doing is we have an incoming uh, stream of data from sensors. Uh, every five seconds, uh, we are calculating for each sensor the average temperature, and then we are outputting it. So, and this is how you would write a, a streaming application with Flink. So, 
this is this is then underneath uh, all converted into a, a logical representation of operators. So and this is your streaming data flow. So no matter what API you use, uh, if, even if you use Flink SQL and you're just writing a pure SQL statement, in the end Flink will compile everything down into this streaming data flow. And then you don't really just run this on one machine. That's the whole point of, of using Flink, right? You want to run this distributed across multiple machines and uh, segment the work and, and, uh, and process it. And what Flink does is it takes care of distributing the workload across all the machines and including resharding your state so that each group of keys so like each sensor in in this case, or each each group each group of sensors is processed in a in a in a different instance. So in our case, we have a window operator which is stateful. If you if you remember what I said before about remembering events, um, what 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 we are doing is um, in in the small code snippet that I showed before is that we are collecting events for uh, five seconds before we trigger um, before we trigger our average computation. So Flink, for every five seconds, Flink needs to keep track of what comes in. And um, Flink always stores the state locally to the in instance that is processing the data. So this is uh, done either in memory on the JVM uh, heap or on disk in an embedded key value store called RocksDB that is just embedded into, into Flink. And this means that state access for your computations is always super fast. So it's either at in memory or at disk speed. And like I mentioned before, one thing that you kind of don't want is to lose all the state if something fails. So uh, Flink, Flink really allows you to uh, make sure that uh, your applications can survive any kind of uh, failure or downtime, but still produce correct and consistent results. And the way Flink makes sure that this happens or that uh, your state um, is fault tolerant is by taking uh, periodic snapshots of this application state, uh, write this snapshots uh, to a persistent storage like S3 or H HDFS or another blob store that you have in your cloud provider. And this action is done asynchronously, so which means that Flink, Flink is backing up your state but it still continues to process data during, during this, uh, this, this snapshotting process. And in this case, because we are using Kafka as a source, which is uh, durable, but also re replayable, uh, the snapshot of state will include not just your window operator, operator state, but it, it will also include the offset uh, or the position in the input stream that, that you are consuming. So when something goes wrong, like if you lose a worker or your jobs get canceled, uh, then Flink just automatically recovers all the embedded states based on the most recent snapshot. And it just, uh, because here we are using a, a replayable source, then it also resets the, the positions of the input stream. So you can continue processing your data like nothing happened, and you can still achieve the highest level of consistency. So you can still ach achieve uh, exactly once processing. And exactly once here doesn't really mean that the events are processed only once. Uh, it means that even if they are processed multiple times, they only affect your application state once. And something more that uh, Flink's, Flink offers based on this uh, mechanism, on, the, on this uh, snapshotting mechanism, is also the possibility to trigger uh, this snapshots manually for whenever you need to do um, planned manual backups of, of your application. This allows you to handle downtime situations like when you want to do 
uh, you want to upgrade your Flink version or you want to migrate to a new cluster, uh, but you don't really want to lose your state or you want to make changes to your code and restart the processing just when you're ready, like if you want to increase the parallelism of your jobs, for example. So with, with this snapshotting mechanism, then you can always recover and restore um, your, your application state and resume processing like nothing, like the application was never done. And the, the last thing that I want to mention here is the way that Flink handles time, because it's also important to understand, um, understand this consistency uh, story. So in Flink, you have support for two different notions of time. So you have event time and you have on the other side processing time. And the easiest way to explain the difference between these two is to look at Star Wars movies. So the order in which um, each of the movies were released is not the same order in which the events actually happened in the story timeline. So in Flink, choosing one or the other, so if choosing between using event time or processing time for, for your application, mostly affects um, the latency with which you're able to process your events and also the correctness of, of your results. So if you want to process your events exactly in the order that they happened in the real world, uh, you can configure Flink to use event time. And this guarantees that your results are deterministic, so always the same. And in our, in our little uh, sensor data processing use case, for example, this would mean that even if a sensor was down for any time, let's say 10 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, Flink would still be able to process it in the, in the correct time window. And because, uh, because Flink, Flink gives you um, tooling that allows you to really reason about and, and handle out of order or even late events if you use event time. And you can always just choose what trade-off you, you want to make between result completeness and latency in processing your results. And on the other hand, if you only care about speed and you don't really care about how correct your results are, uh, you can also configure Flink to just use processing time. And just to recap, um, what makes Flink uh, different to other stream processors in this uh, is this combination of uh, characteristics. So uh, on one side, it gives you flexible APIs that allow you to choose between um, ease of use and expressiveness and uh, allow you to cover a really wide range of use cases and also skills. Uh, it treats state as a first class citizen and it has a rich time semantics that allow you to not give up or not have to choose between correctness and completeness and, and also allows you to reprocess historical data consistently and it's optimized for high performance with local state access uh, that allows you to perform computations at in-memory speed and allows you also to achieve high throughput with really low latency and in lastly it, it also ensures that your applications are fault tolerant and that can handle failures with the highest level of consistency if you need it. And yeah, so like I said, I, my intention was to give you an overview of Flink, not really to dive really deep into it. Um, so here, if, if you want to know more about Flink or if you're interested in trying it out, I'm leaving here some links um, that, that you can use to do that depending on um, whatever, whatever background you have or whatever programming language you prefer. So uh, if you're a Java or Scala person, you can uh, start with the self-based training that, that is in the documentation. If, on the other hand, you just want to write SQL, 
and uh, not not code at all. Uh, you there's a really good uh, GitHub repository that has a Flink SQL walk walkthrough. And if you're a Python person, uh, their documentation also has a really good PyFlink uh, tutorial. And you can also get started on uh, Apache Zeppelin notebooks. There are also some guides out there um, that make it really, really easy to write your first Flink application. And other than that, you can visit um, flink.apache.org. And you can subscribe to the user mailing list if you need help or, or just use Stack Overflow. The community is really responsive uh, in both. And you will, you will get an answer usually from a maintainer or from someone else in the community um, considerably, considerably fast. And if you want to uh, keep up with what's going on in Flink, so uh, for example, we are about to have a new release of Flink 1.12. Uh, the best way to stay up to date is uh, by following Apache Flink on Twitter. And another way, another way that you can that you can get started is also just using the Viverica Platform Community Edition. It is uh, pretty easy to set up. It's free forever. Um, you don't have a limit on the the size of the applications that you can build with it. And also, it recently introduced uh, support for Flink SQL, so it has a nice editor where you can just or or a nice interface where you can just uh, write SQL statements and uh, and submit and submit submit uh, jobs to to a fun cluster. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you so much. I will take questions if there are any. I don't think there are any questions. There's still time, so I will give it a couple of minutes. If, if you want to ask a question, otherwise you can always, you can always just find me on either on the Open Source Summit uh, Slack, or you can Follow me on Twitter, send me a DM, and ask away. I will also leave here the link to the slides in case you want to check them out. The links are clickable, so you just go for it. And if there are no questions, I will close the session and Please feel free to reach out to me at any time in any platform. I will be glad to uh, to chat and to give you some more directions into getting started with Flink if if you need them. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the summit. <laughs>